Tonight, I'm gonna to prove you can capture extremely faint, challenging nebulae with just Canon's starter DSLR and kit lens on a star tracker. And I'm going head to head with Astro Backyard in this challenge. You'll see I have a few tricks up my sleeve like electrical tape. Oh boy. So this is a five minute exposure and I still can't see my nebula. This either could be genius or Trevor's gonna wipe the floor with me. Man, I've never been so like scared to show one of my images and get some tips for imaging in the winter. I really hate shoveling frozen snow. Okay, I'm in the car. I'm about to drive down to a spot in Rhode Island where I know it's dark because I've been there before, but it's also supposed to be both clear and still tonight according to the forecast. All right, I've arrived here in Rhode Island, and the first issue is that we have some snow to deal with. In my experience, I've always had better stability when I actually have the tripod feet touching the ground. It really does feel still tonight. I, I don't feel or hear any wind, and that's very good because I'm going after a very faint object. So I'm going to try to push my exposure so that I can get the histogram on the back of the camera at least about one third over from the left. That's a good rule of thumb, but from a dark site like this, it can be hard to achieve um, and still have round stars on a star tracker. So I'm going to work extra hard to dial in balance and polar alignment to make sure I can really push the exposure like this. Okay, time for polar alignment. And first off, here's a new secret weapon of Mine. The folks at Hunt's Photo and Video sent me this Mini Max stool, and it's an ingenious stool for astrophotographers because it has multiple positions that you can put it in, and this lowest position is quite low like this, which is great position for polar aligning. Uh, so now I don't have to actually sit on the cold ground. I can just put this down and have a nice stool. And Hunts was kind enough to give a discount for viewers of this channel. So if you'd like one of these stools, you can get a nice discount and the, the link is in the description. Okay, here's the thing with polar alignment that I think confuses a lot of people. Uh, especially with the Star Adventure and other trackers, um, where once you loosen this RA clutch and you go to your target, you can see the whole polar scope rotates with the RA axis. So why is this an issue? Well, let's say you have polar alignment completely dialed in here. You know, I'm facing the North Celestial Pole, but then I move to target and I recheck my polar alignment and it's confusing, right? Because the whole reticule has rotated. But this is the key thing. Is Poli has Polaris actually moved? Because it shouldn't have. If you didn't bump the mount, even when you do this, Polaris will actually be in the same position in the circle. All that's happened is the, the circle has rotated because you've rotated the reticule. Okay, so this is one thing to understand conceptually, but here comes the actual tricky part, which is getting a good polar alignment, then moving everything, see, so you're lined up with your target, and not having bumped the polar alignment out. There's two keys to this. One is good balance. So you can see how I, this is very well balanced. I can move it around and nothing down here is moving. The second is don't over tighten these clutches, right? So we just need these to be just sort of finger tight here. And then when we get them, when we get it to the right position, Again, we just need to go just finger tight and then just a little bit more. No need to over tighten them. Um, the same thing with this, this clutch up here. This one's even trickier, I think. I think I have it too tight right now. But the cool thing about the declination is we have these slow motion controls here. The next thing I'm gonna do here is I'm going to tape down the zoom exactly how I want it with a, a bright electrical tape. This lens does not have a zoom lock, so this is necessary if you want to avoid the zoom drifting just from gravity or from accidentally bumping it uh, when checking focus. So I'm just gonna find 105 here, and then I'm gonna go ahead and tape that down. So that's sort of like a lock. Okay, now that I have that taped, I uh, went ahead and got my dew heater strap. This one's uh, USB powered. Uh, so I have a little uh, USB battery that I can use it with. And this just makes it so that the, we can be sure that the lens isn't gonna frost up here. This is especially important with this lens since it doesn't have a lens hood, um, which does provide some protection against dew and frost. Lastly, I have this little cheap Bodnov mask for focusing. It's uh, not at all designed for this focal length of 105 millimeters. You can see the spacing on the pattern is pretty coarse. 
um, but it will do okay for me tonight um, because my object is right next to the bright star Rigel. That might give you a clue. And with a bright star, even a non-ideal Bogdanov mask like this one will still work. Uh, it will, I, I'm just gonna probably end up taking one second test exposures to get the pattern bright enough. Tonight I'm using a wireless intervalometer. Wired ones work well too, but with a, a wired one, I usually need to figure out a way um, to make sure that there's no possibility of the cable catching on something and ruining the exposure. And uh, this time I'm just going to eliminate that possibility by using my wireless intervalometer. I did put fresh batteries in it to make sure. Uh, speaking of batteries, I only have one for the Canon T7, so we should get to shooting because <laughs> batteries don't last as long in the cold weather and I already feel behind. So let's take our real first test exposure. So this is a five minute exposure and I still can't see my nebula. This either could be genius or Trevor's gonna wipe the floor with me. I think it's gonna be okay though. I, I just have to remain confident in my plan for this challenge. Uh, let me show you the histogram here. Uh, we just go to playback and click the uh, display button. You can see this is how I evaluate exposure and know if I've exposed long enough in a single light or single sub exposure. With a tracker, you want to get this histogram peak at least off the left hand side of the chart. And ideally you want it somewhere between one quarter and one half over from the left. I'm going to really try to get as many photons on the object as I can in each exposure, which is why I'm exposing to one third. And we'll just have confidence that when we stack and stretch it, it will be there. All right, the battery's on one bar. We've gotten about three hours out, out of it so far, so I'm pretty pleased. I'm gonna stop now though and take some flats. Um, I'm gonna take the bias and dark frames later after I can charge the battery, because I think that the temps have been pretty good night to night. Um, so it's more critical to take the flats right now so I can capture this exact zoom and focus position as it is. And to take the flats, I'm just going to put this uh, tablet with a white screen on top very carefully. I'll get that histogram peak about uh, half over uh, which is a good flat for a DSLR. And uh, once we have that dialed in, I'll take about 30 flats. So I'm just gonna place this very carefully while holding um, the zoom position, just like that. And then I'm gonna um, pull up my intervalometer and get in some kind of position here uh, to, to do this. Uh, I don't think I can film at the same time, but, but I'll figure it out. We're now going to look at some highlights from a great conversation I had with Trevor Jones, also known as Astro Backyard, about this kit lens challenge. And I'm going to occasionally pause our conversation to emphasize or elaborate on something that we're talking about. So if you've already seen some of these clips in Trevor's video, you can think of this as watching it with the DVD commentary track uh, turned on. Hey, Nico. How's it going, man? Hey, I'm good. I, I just uh, got back from shooting my deep sky object with the kit. I did the same. Actually, uh, the turnaround for how quickly we were able to use this setup after it arrived was surprising, especially for the weather I've been getting lately. I actually got to use it, I think it was about four days after it arrived. Yeah, yeah, just a few days after. And, you know, it was also just good timing because uh, it was a night where... I got in my um, imaging time before the moon rose. Um, like, I think it was, I think I did like uh, 9 to nine p.m. to midnight, and that was right before the moon rose at around 1 a.m. Okay, the moon thing. This, this is something that I don't talk enough about on my channel, and I'm gonna try to do a better job of it. Uh, the, uh, the moon is basically just like another light pollution source. So if you go to a dark site during full moon, uh, you're you're really not capitalizing on that dark sky um, because the moon is like a big spotlight in the sky basically and the closer your deep sky object is to the moon in the sky the worse it'll get and you'll have really bad gradients and all kinds of problems um, there are solutions for imaging during the moon the most effective is using a an h alpha narrowband filter um, because the moonlight is is broadband and is very blue and so if you're imaging in the deep reds, you can mostly avoid the effects of moonlight. But that's just getting into sort of an advanced uh, topic. This is about beginner stuff. So the best solution is just to, when you're going after faint objects with a DSLR, try to shoot them either um, before the moon has risen, which is what both uh, Trevor and I did, or after it's set, or during new moon. So 
one uh, interesting thing about using this lens is that um, some zoom lenses have a lock, a focus lock. So basically it's just a little switch, just like autofocus or manual focus, but it just locks the focus position. This lens doesn't have that. So I can just push the lens like that and it changes the focus position, right? So to prevent that, one thing I always have in my bag when I'm out um, shooting is electrical tape and usually of a bright color like this so I can see it in the dark and I just tape the lens. So I just tape it so that it's it can't move. So funny, funny story about that. I, I too have a blue electrical tape that I keep in my uh, little bag of gear stuff at all times for, for many reasons, whether it's you know taping a, a power outlet in or something, you always need tape. And I knew that going in, I even wrote in my notes, tape the lens down the focal length because yeah, it's it doesn't take much to lose it. I totally forgot, I framed up my target, got the focal length that I wanted, did not tape it, continued through to shoot for three hours, adjusting fo uh, focus, all these situations where I could have easily knocked it out, got so lucky that I didn't. So as the battery was dying on that one, one bar left, I was like, oh, should I take a few more exposures or, sh or should I start taking darks right now? Temperature matched darks. As I thought about that, I knocked the focal length. I'm like, oh my God, like that's it. I'm done for the night because I've changed the focal length. There's no way I'll get it back other than eyeballing it to, to where it was. And I was like, wow, I could have really screwed myself because I didn't tape it and I, I really should have. So did, so did you get flats? I No, took no flats. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. interesting. I just want to point out here that uh, Trevor uh, wanted to take flats. It's just that he couldn't because he didn't tape his lens and the zoom position changed. So there's a big difference. Uh, flats are always a good thing to do, even with a, a clean lens. Um, you know, there may be a little bit less necessary if you're sure there's no dust in your system, but there's still always a really good thing to do. They're one of my favorite calibration frames in terms of the difference they make. But if you don't have, um, the same conditions that you have when you're taking your light frames, your pictures of the night sky, for when you take your flats, then they could do more harm than good. So that's why Trevor, once the lens uh, zoom position changed, was just like, well, now I can't take flats because um, it's very important that you have the exact same uh, system optically. And with a lens like this, where it doesn't have any kind of stops, there's no way to know how to get back to that exact same position you were in before. So it, um, flats are difficult. Um, I'm not going to like sugarcoat it and say that for a beginner, flats are just the easiest thing. But I feel that once you sort of develop your own system for taking flats and doing it correctly, then it becomes pretty easy and routine. So. Uh, one video idea that I want to do is all about flats and different ways to take them so that you can find a system that's easy for you um, and that works for your system so that you don't have to worry about flats and whether they're going to, um, you know, mess up your pictures because really they should only help if they're done correctly. Okay. W one thing about using a new kit for the first time in doing a real project and not testing. Cause like, I'm such a tester, you know, usually what I would do if I got a new lens or something is I would do test shots at different focal ratios to see how the star performance changed. And I didn't do that at all this time. So I was just flying blind thinking, okay, I'm just gonna let in a bunch of light and see what happens. Um, yeah, it was interesting. I, I will say I, I, I found out that I actually had used this lens. I sort of forgot about it because like I must have sold it. But actually my first tracked deep sky photo was with this lens. Uh, so I got I to gotta show that to you because I think you'd get a kick out of it. That's really cool. Yeah, because it is a, a kit lens, one of my first DSLRs came with it. And I actually tried to use it for nature photography, which if you can imagine a, a lens this slow at 300 millimeter in the daytime trying to capture a bird flying by, like it was the epitome of frustration. A lot of blurry photos of uh, robins and birds that I saw around me. Yeah, it was a terrible lens for any type of nature photography. That actually brings up a really good point. A lot of people think if they're coming from one style of photography to astrophotography that they know about a lens. Like they're like, oh, this is a great lens. They try it for, for the stars and it sucks. You know, it's like it, there's often just no correlation between like this 
per, superb L glass lens for daytime and you bring it under the stars and there's just huge coma, you know, those like all the stars turn into little seagulls and things and you just have no idea till you test it. That's right, yes. All the value in a lot of those expensive lenses is for what it can do in the daytime and the quick focusing and all that stuff that doesn't apply to astrophotography at all. Yeah. One thing I do like is that, you know, some lens makers are thinking about astrophotography now. I think maybe because we all sort of came and started buying their lenses, then they've now started marketing lenses <laughs> to astrophotographers, which I think is cool. Like uh, Rokinon does it a little bit and um, Sigma too. Yep, those fast manual lenses. Yeah, it's perfect for us. Yeah. Cool. So uh, I guess I could say the 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 f ratio that I, I shot with, and uh, so I stopped down to f six point three on the seventy five to three hundred millimeter lens. Uh, how about you? Did you shoot wide open or did you uh, stop down as well? I I shot wide open. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this might give a. Cl Another clue, uh, but I wanted I wanted as many photons on this object as possible, and so I didn't want to stop down. And also, my style of processing, I know that I can deal with stars being a little wonky, um, so I'm less concerned about stopping down to get really good star performance because I know that I'd rather sort of deal with it in post-processing because I'm a very like heavy post-processor. I do a lot on the image. That's a great point. So the settings that you choose um, you know, others might say, well, you know what, I think it would be better if you did this, but it's like, well, no, based on my processing style, uh, you'd rather sacrifice some star bloat for more photons on your sounding like a very faint deep sky object. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, that makes a lot of sense to me. I figured um, stopping down one stop might sharpen things up a little bit because I was scared these stars were going to be really, really bad. And I was pleasantly surprised at the fact that they weren't they were totally acceptable especially considering uh this is a very budget lens even though everything that trevor and i are talking about in this section is is correct i do think that once you get some experience with astrophotography you'll realize what works for you and what style of processor you are on the other hand with this particular lens, I think Trevor was completely right <laughs> in retrospect after we saw each other's images to stop it down a stop. Okay, I guess it's time to uh, to show you my picture. And uh, I, 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 I spent about, f I would say about five hours processing, maybe a little more, uh, a lot yesterday, a lot this, like a little bit more this morning with a fresh pair of eyes. And uh, I've honestly, I've been staring at it for too long. So um, hopefully when you see it for the first time, you'll, you'll be amazed, but I, I think I'm just tired of looking at it at this point. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, it, I can at least say that, you know what, I've done pretty well for the amount uh, of data that I actually collected. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now. Nice, wow. Did yes, we shoot we, the same target? Yes, we did shoot the same target. Oh, come on! And we, we took no very, way. okay, and we took very different takes on it, which I am so glad about. And uh, yours looks amazing though, Trevor. This is really well done. I, I appreciate that. And this is also my biggest fear that we'd have a direct head-to-head -head comparison of my processing skills versus yours because I know you're gonna win that battle. Oh no, no, I know. I just oh. think they're they're just very they're just very differently. I I went for uh, a different scene and and I also brought out I tried to bring out the other stuff there that is re I really shouldn't have because my picture got so noisy because I was going after stuff that's actually even fainter than the witch head. The witch head is the brightest object in my scene. While you just focused on the witch head, which is actually much smarter. That's really what I should have done. Um, so it's really just a strategy thing. And you, you, I think your strategy worked out better. Um, one thing I, I really wasn't happy with was uh, the way these yellow stars turned out inside uh, the witch head. And uh, as, as I'm sure you did too, there was a lot of selective masking and curve stretching of specific areas of the image. Uh, and I really pulled up the dust for the witch's head so you could really see it. 
Um, and I, unfortunately in that process, I did bring some stars with me and then there was some minimizing afterwards. And yeah, it was a, it was a, it was quite the process to, to get it here. And I still feel like it's a little too punchy and contrasty where it's just like, boom, you see the shape of the witch's head there where I w wish there was more of the subtle dust in the area that I'm sure I'm going to see in your, your image. Well, it's funny. Cause I mean, we always, <laughs> we always see someone else's image and we're like, oh, I wish I would have done it like that. Cause I mean, cause to me, I saw this and I was like, oh, his has so much more punch than mine. And you, and you know exactly where to look. I like the composition better. I like that it's, you know, I like the widescreen cause I went completely different with composition. And so it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, whenever I see someone else's image, I'm like, oh, I wish I would have done it that way. But, um, <laughs> you know, I did. And the other funny thing is like, we're always our worst critic. And when you, I didn't notice that thing you were telling me about how you brought up the star, you couldn't, you brought up the stars with the nebula. And so then they look a little bit different than the other stars. And I didn't notice that until you pointed it out. And then of course, cause you pointed it out, I can see it now, but it's like, if you hadn't said anything, I probably wouldn't have noticed that. That's right. Yeah. We look at images, um, you know, from the standpoint of like, I've been looking at this for six hours. So yeah, I've, I've noticed every little thing about it. Um, so yeah, now I really can't wait to see yours and what you've done. But of course, there's that bright star, uh, Rigel it is, right? And uh, so there was my focusing point and uh, you can see some uh, our artifacts next to it, uh, thanks to this, you know, budget lens we're using. But overall, the stars looked a lot better than I thought they would uh, with this lens. And uh, yeah, so there you go. That's why I chose this target, a reflection nebula, those really cool blues and the dust all the things that doesn't require an astro modified sensor. Uh, I haven't shot the witch head nebula in I think like nine years. Um, so yeah, it was something I wanted to do again and I just thought it would be a great uh, choice for this combo. So, and when I said, you know, it's not the, necessarily the, the crowd pleaser object. Um, when I showed my wife this for the first time and uh, I said, this is what I shot last night. And she's like, that's it? Like, that's what you shot? Like, she's expecting to see a really beautiful, like, rosette nebula or something. And I was like, no, hopefully people appreciate how difficult this target actually is. It's, 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 it's a hard, yeah, it's a hard balance because it's like, you know, I, it's, I'm this exact same way. It's like, if you're trying to please astrophotographers, which head <laughs> is, is where you go? Because it's like, you, we recognize this is a hard thing. It's like, it's like, a dusty reflection nebula. It's so dim that you can't see it in a single exposure. You, or you, if you can, you could barely see it. I don't know if you could, but like, so for, oh, even I, framing it, you're like, the I first don't know. time I saw it is the first time I saw it is when I actually put it into Photoshop and stretched a single exposure. I could not see it on the, the display screen at all, but I knew it was there because of the, the star pattern. And, and speaking of that, this, uh, this field actually has a very, very useful star pattern configuration around it for reference. Uh, not just, just Rigel, but these other three by the top here and the one right next to it. So they made framing this target actually a lot easier than it could have been. Yeah, and just to go back to Rigel, uh, another thing is like, it's just, it's just makes it so much easier if you have a really bright star in your field to focus on. I know we've already talked about this, but Rigel is a very bright star. It's, it's like, in the winter sky, it's like Betelgeuse, Rigel, and Sirius. Those are the three brightest. And so this is a very bright star. And you, so you can just put your Badenov mask on. You might be able to even see the pattern in live view. If not, you could take a one second exposure and you'll see it. Um, Absolutely. And uh, I did try to manually dither the images uh, a little bit. So I, t I used the actual... Um, the slow motion controls on the Star Adventure, just shifting the frame ever so slightly between every, say, 10 shots or so. I don't know if that made a difference in terms of the, the, the noise uh, after stacking, uh, but it was something, a little trick I tried to just help deal with some of that noise as opposed to, and also more, like actually more for avoiding walking noise or something uh, that if I didn't move it over time, that could have created a noise pattern that I wanted to avoid. So I don't know if you, you did anything like that. I didn't. I was so concerned about um, messing up my polar alignment, like I said earlier, that uh, I was just, I wasn't going to touch the mount. I, I I was only trying to touch just the the lens to, to focus to, or to check focus. 
but I was I I didn't want to mess anything with the mount, so I, I I didn't do any manual dithering. That that's actually a technique I've never tried. I really should because I, I bet it does help. Yeah, I, I don't think it could hurt uh, unless yeah you do throw off your polar alignment, which makes a lot of sense because you were shooting longer exposures. So yeah, for you to to lose five minutes at a time, you you really had to just let it you know get it right and leave it as long as possible. So yeah, I'm ready to see your image now, and uh, I still don't know what focal length you shot at or how you framed it, so I'm really excited to see it. Oh man. Here we go. You did, okay, so Rigel, almost near the center with all the surrounding dust, and you even got some of the red hydrogen from a stock camera pulled out of there yeah it's pretty noisy <laughs> but <laughs> that's the that's the that's the tip of barnard's loop so barnard's loop extends to rigel basically and then goes all the way up to almost beetlejuice which it's this huge hydrogen bubble around the orion constellation and so i just think that getting a little bit of barnard's loop in there is sort of cool i cannot can you believe that we shot the same same object. It's, it's insane, yeah. Like, there is you know, unlimited amount of targets in the night sky. I mean, to narrow it down to the, you know, the bright stuff, I guess, but still, I just can't believe we shot the same target. So one thing that's interesting to see is that um, because your Rigel is closer to the center of the frame, um, that um, halo is more central, whereas it's hanging off the side in mine, which makes sense, right? Because it's near the center. So that's cool to see. Yes, and actually, th that that was in my plan, mostly just because I was like, okay, I know that the whole witch head is going to be in at 105 millimeter focal length if I just center Rigel. So then I knew that I could very quickly frame it up too. And, yes. But and I and I wasn't even thinking about the halo. But you're right on a on a lens like this where you're going to have halos. If you can get the bright star centered, uh, and it works with your composition then you'll have a very centered halo. And that I think it does look better. Uh, so, and uh, Deep Sky Stacker you used to, uh, to stack, right? Right. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, we limited ourselves to Deep Sky Stacker, Photoshop, and Starnet if we needed it. Um, but I really don't think that um, any techniques or, you know, using PixInsight or any, anything like that could have really done too much more to this data that we collected. Um, I mean, nothing that we, uh, like, I, we could have maybe smoothed things out a little bit more, but I mean, it is what it is. It was, you know, three hours of data of some faint nebulosity shot with a stock DSLR camera uncooled. Yeah. And it, because we were both going from dark skies, you know, and I didn't have gradient issues either. So I didn't, I really didn't, I didn't do any gradient extraction for, with this. I just took it out of deep sky stacker brought it in, balanced the color channels, and then, and then went into processing. Um, yeah. the, the, the reason that I often like Cyril or PixInsight is because of, they have these really nice gradient extraction tools if you're shooting from a light polluted place. Um, but from a dark sky, you really, you can, you can just do DSS and Photoshop and it works just as well. Yeah, I, 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 it was a Bortle class four site that I drove out to for this project as well. And I mean, this, I, like I could not attempt this from home in the backyard um, in the Bortle class seven skies. It would just be, um, I would need at least, you know, quadruple the exposure time to get what I got. Uh, and that was just a practicality thing, right? Like um, it's not to say that it can't be done in a light polluted area, but we were shooting without filters and uh, with limited time. So I, I'm pretty impressed with, uh, you know, what both of us were able to achieve with this system in a limited amount of time. And it's really cool to see uh, that we shot the same target, but in a very different way. So cool to see. You've now seen what Trevor and I could do with just a kit lens and a stock DSLR. And like Trevor, I was really pleased with our results. But I wanna see what you can do. You can share your photos taken with the kit lens with me by tagging me on Instagram and use the hashtag kit lens challenge. I plan to make more videos using this kit, including the other lens that came with it, which is the 18 to 55. And if you share your photos with me, I may feature them in a future video. Well, till next time, this has been Nico Carver, nebulaphotos.com, clear skies.